Welcome, everybody, to our live stream in the trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics in our outstanding studios, as always. So the players, training camp is underway. They're back. They're officially back. And they had their ramp-up days, the Bengals did, without shoulder pads, just helmets and game jerseys, shorts, and all that sort of thing. Now they're in full equipment. And um, so they've had a just a couple of day, uh, one one full day of, of one day of full pads, I should say. Today they're meeting, but they're not practicing. Uh, everything's collectively bargained. So many days on, and they have to have a day off. So many days on, have to have a day off. So that's what's going on today. So we figured today would be a great day to do the live stream. We got the first day of full pads uh, under their belt, under their belts, and got to see some things first time live one-on-one -on -one pass rush drill. And uh, some guys definitely showed themselves a little bit in, in, in that regard, both sides of the football. And from a pass protection standpoint and also from a, from a pass rushing standpoint. So they anchored their pads as such, and they will continue to do so. They'll have um, practice full pads now for their duration leading up to that first preseason game against the Arizona Cardinals, which is coming up in less than 10 days. I mean, it's, it's, it's a week from a uh, week from Friday. So here we go. National football league is back. And I don't think there'll be a whole lot of uh, frontline players playing in that first preseason game. I'm not sure that many frontline players will play very much in the preseason at all, to be honest with you. I think on a league wide basis, it's going to be very, very sparing in terms of how many snaps key players are going to play. Uh, the, the primary requisite for all these staffs and requirement is get guys to the opener healthy. That's the bottom line. You don't want to lose anybody um, of any significance to any kind of a serious injury for any length of time or God forbid out for the season. And they happen. I mean, you, you can't, it's a, it's a contact sport. You can't avoid it, but you can, uh, you can do some things to try to minimize. And, and that's what they're, they're doing. The Bengals do a very good job. Zach Taylor and his coaching staff do a good job of, of uh, teaching the players how to practice in the national football league. And they'll do that verbally, you know, in meetings. Then they'll also show tape to the players. This is what we want. This is what we don't want. And what they don't want, obviously, is the collisions taking people to the ground, guys getting their legs tangled up and falling to the ground awkwardly and, and injuries that can occur in that regard. So it's uh, th there is an art to it. You, you, you go full speed up to a certain point and then shut it down. Don't take people to the ground and things of that nature. So there is a little bit of a, a ramping up for, for young players coming to the National Football League, learning how to practice the right way effectively. So... They're in the process of that at this stage of training camp. There's no question about it. But we thought live stream would be appropriate. You guys always have great questions. And uh, you are the show for this particular podcast, video cast. So we'll we'll get right to it and start, uh, start checking our little uh, messages here, see who is bringing it today. D.E. Elliott. Hey, Lap, if possible, have you gotten a good look at Ben Brown? If so, what do you think? Uh, yes, Ben Brown. I have watched uh, Ben Brown. Ben Brown caught my eye, quite honestly, in the early stages of, of uh, OTAs and, and mini camps and things of that nature. And um, Ben Brown probably would have been third, fourth round pick out of Mississippi. I'm pretty sure it's Mississippi if he had not been injured. Um, so I think the Bengals got some value with him. Ben Brown is a guy that, uh, has got tremendous feet. He's always got his feet in the right position and he seems to understand hand placement, but now the rubber meets the road. Now the pads come on and you find out, uh, you know, if you, what you thought you saw is true. Sometimes guys are all Americans in underwear ball and, Certainly not all Americans when shoulder pads and, and full equipment come on. Uh, ben Brown, though, played at a high level of football in the SEC. I think Ben Brown is, uh, is – is, he belongs. Let me put it this way. He's not over his head. He's not out of his league in a National Football League camp. The other thing that you need to determine 
is how quick a study are guys? How quickly do they pick it up? How well do they retain it? You know, do, does it seem like they have it one day at practice and then the next day or two days later, when you come back to things that you had installed in practice a couple of days ago, they act like they'd never seen it before. Um, and everybody has different learning curves, different learning abilities. Some guys get it right away. Some guys, it takes a little while. Some guys never get it. <laughs> you have to find out what kind of a learner all these young players are, Ben Brown included. You have to, and, and then you proceed accordingly. Once you determine what kind of a learner this guy is, you can work with it. There have been some, I've had teammates that were just, you know, smart as whip. Once they saw it, they take the chalkboard to the playing field, no problem. Other guys had to get on the playing field before they understood it. They could not translate it from the chalkboard to the playing field. They had to go out and physically rep it, physically go through it, physically see what the steps were like and everything else. And then they started to get it and had great uh, players as teammates. That it took a while for some guys to learn and to understand it. Other guys, like I said, never got it. And those guys never really amounted to much or never made the team. And then you get situations and in, in circumstances over the years where a guy with tremendous ability couldn't make it because he just couldn't learn, you know, just couldn't get it done. Coaches couldn't rely on it. It doesn't matter if you run a four, three, eight, 40 and you're, you're executing the wrong assignment. You're not where you be not. You're not where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. It doesn't mean a hill of beans. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you can bench 500 pounds if you're blocking the wrong guy. And the guy you're supposed to be blocking is, is running free, making a play, and you're blocking a guy somebody else is blocking, and you got two guys blocking one because you don't know what the hell you're supposed to do, and the guy you're supposed to be taking care of is running and making a play. It, it, athleticism and strength and speed and all those things are great, but so is what you have upstairs, you know? I mean, that's why guys that God bless with both – uh, the physical skills and the mental capacity are great players, Hall of Fame players. <clears throat> and then, you know, it ratchets down from there to guys that can't play in the National Football League for reasons that we just mentioned. So long story short, Ben Brown definitely passes the eyeball test. Now he's going to get tested a little bit more with shoulder pads on. I think physically he's got what it takes now. Does he have this? And we'll find out. We'll find out. Don't really know at this point in time. But I, I have a feeling that he can handle it. I really, I, I think he's got a shot. Yeah, kind of follow up, Dave. Stephen McCoy comes in. Can we, could we flip? He says, Trent Hill, he, he did correct himself and say Trey in another post here for, for a pick to Tampa Bay with uh, Jensen being out. Yeah, I think Tampa Bay uh, has drafted well. And I think Tampa Bay feels like they've got Trey Hill. <laughs> so, well, you know, why would they trade for... Uh, a Trey Hill uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to be a center when you've already got one that you drafted, that you've already got on the roster, that's already studied the, the uh, you know, their, their installation of their, not just game plan, but their entire playbook, you'd be further along. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it all depends if, if, if uh, Tampa Bay Buccaneers held Hill in high regard coming out of college, they might, uh, they might be able to do that. Hill was a late round pick by the Bengals. So I'm not sure there'd be a tremendous amount of value there necessarily, but you explore everything. And this is the time of year where you start to, uh, you know, based on holdouts, based on injuries, based on whatever. Now it is when you put the feelers out there and it takes a couple weeks. Um, when the, when the Bengals, signed B.J. Hill last year when they traded for him with the Giants and they got B.J. Hill, that was a two- or three-week process. That didn't happen overnight. They put feelers out. They knew they needed another interior guy that could handle a pass rush in case of injury, and they put feelers out there, and they were talking to the Giants and other teams for a long time, significantly significant amount of time through training camp, and after about a two-, three-week process, the deal, the deal happened right before the end of training camp. So that's the things that you're going to see trades that are going to happen after final cut downs and all that sort of thing. All these dialogues are going on now because every personnel department is studying the, uh, the, the rosters of other teams, where are their strengths? 
And boy, do they have a this this fourth tight end on this football team? He's not even going to make their football team, but he's probably better than our third tight end. We may make a little offer here and see what we can drum up, and whatever the case may be, I'm just picking a picking a position. Those kind of things go on all day long by the personnel departments all around the National Football League every day of training camp. These things just don't happen. All of a sudden, you just don't. When the Bengals traded for Hill, they didn't call the Giants and say, hey, yeah, yeah, we really like this B.J. Hill. Let's, didn't, it doesn't come together that fast. Because, you know, if, if you suffer an injury at a position and, and you're, you're saying, okay, well, I, I got to go get something done here, teams have depth at, their, at every position that they have in training camp for the same reason. They're thinking, what if we have an injury to that position? We'd like to have the guy that we just traded uh, to whatever team. So they try to get all the way through training camp and get down to those final roster numbers before they make those last final piece additions and tweak in their roster. But the process has started and it's underway. It'll be interesting. It'd be interesting to eavesdrop on uh, some of the Bengals phone calls they're making around the league and some of the calls, not only the calls, outgoing calls that are being made, but the incoming calls that are being made about players that, uh, you know, teams around the National Football League have an interest in with the Cincinnati Bengals would be interesting. Probably the player we get most asked about, Thaddeus Moss, over the last year. Uh, who did guys lap salt piece on Thaddeus Moss recently? How is he looking in camp? And we also want to tell everybody, we had the Bengals tight end coach on in the trenches uh, here the other week. And in the part two, you, he talks about every one of the tight ends in camp. So make sure you go back and check that out if you haven't seen it. But I'll let you answer the question. Yeah, I mean, Thaddeus Moss is, uh, is looking like he always looks. <laughs> He's a really good receiver. Thaddeus Moss is um, a runs routes about as well as wide receivers run it. That's what Hayden Hurst is doing as well. Hayden Hurst, in my estimation, is going to have an impact because they're going to run a lot of uh, 11 personnel, which is one back, one tight end, three wide receivers, because the Bengals have as good a three wide receiver package as anybody in the National Football League. And Hayden Hurst is going to get favorable matchups. And Hayden Hurst gets in and out of his cuts for a big-bodied guy, about as well as I've seen. He doesn't round them off. When he sinks his hips and gets out of into the cut and out of the cut, it's sharp. It's a it's a quick cut, you know. It's a it's a a, a, a ninety degree angle. It's not you know a, uh, it's not a rounded angle. It is precise, and that's a big deal. That's when you get separation. Fred Belitnikov ran like a four six forty. Fred Belitnikov's in the Hall of Fame because when he ran, he was an unbelievable route runner. And when he sunk his hips and got in and out of cuts, he created separation on guys that ran four four forties. So the route running part of it is big, and Thaddeus Moss does a great job of that as well. He's he's a very talented uh, you know route runner, and uh, uh, like we talked about before, Thaddeus Moss has a rapport and a relationship with Joe Burrow, and that that counts for something. Um, so will he be one of the uh, tight ends that make the final roster? Not sure about that. Not sure. Could he be a guy on the 16-man practice squad? Well, yeah. And remember, that, that that's, that's the thing that it's not just the 53-man roster. Every team in the NFL now has a 16-man practice squad. So if you don't make the final cut, your NFL career is not done. I mean, there's 32 teams that are looking to complete a 16-man practice squad. You're talking almost 500 players. That's, that's significant. That's quite a few jobs. And Thaddeus Moss will be, would be on somebody's practice squad, in my estimation, and hopefully it's the Bengals' practice squad. Um, but you, you just never know. You just never know. So uh, he's, in, he's in a battle for sure. But I think, you know, his relationship and the confidence and trust, and trust is a big word. When a quarterback trusts his receiver, whether it be a wide receiver, tight end, running back, trust is massive, massive. And the trust between Joe Burrow and Thaddeus Moss is significant. It's, it's, it's there for sure. Two-part question from Ryan. Dave, you're the man. We all know that. How's the wide receiver battle, Stanley Morgan, Mike Thomas, and then also I think Trent Taylor did very well. Punt returner is being pushed by Irwin, Lassner, et cetera. Yeah, 
and, and that's going to be decided by special teams. And, and Ryan, um, yeah, th- th- this, that, that's going to be a, a, a major league contest going on there. And honestly, in, in today's football, the Bengals defense is a great example. Lou Anarumo, his base defense, he ran nickel packages over 50% of the time. In a nickel package, there's only two linebackers on the field, and there's five defensive backs. A dime package, there's only one linebacker, six defensive backs. And they went nickel and dime a ton. They may even go, you know, four down linemen and seven defensive backs at some point in time because that's where the numbers are going to be. They're going to probably have five linebackers on their game day roster, maybe five. They're going to have seven defensive backs, at least, probably eight. Uh, maybe even nine, if need be. They're going to have six, seven wide receivers. That's where the special teams players are, wide receiver and defensive back. So out of the receivers that we're talking about, who is going to give the most snaps to Darren Simmons in the form of special teams? Now, Tyler Boyd, obviously, lock. Jamar Chase, I'm going alphabetically here. Alpha is a lock, you think? Uh, T. Higgins is not able to do everything yet after that shoulder surgery. Lock. T. I'm telling you what, Jamar Chase looks even better physically, if that's possible, than he did last year. The fun with him is going to start after he catches the football. His lower body is even stronger. I mean, the guy's faster. He's in. He got himself in unbelievable shape. He hired a track coach, did some things with a track coach in the offseason to uh, increase his uh, stamina, endurance, and all those things. He is He's a specimen, man. It's unbelievable. And T. Higgins looks like he grew. He looks like he's at least 6'4". I think his shoulders get broader and wider. They're, they're, they're a heck of a package. So we talked about Hayden Hurst. We're talking wideouts now. Trenton Irwin, don't forget about him. He's a, He's got the capability of returning punts. He plays solid special teams. Stanley Morgan, in my mind, is, is a guy that I would count on to be that fourth receiver because he's showing in training camp that he has ability as a wide receiver. He's made plays. He's caught the football in traffic. He's made tough catches. He's made he's shown his physicality with contested catches, um, and, he, and he's an outstanding special teams player. So you're going to have to unseat Stanley Morgan. I mean, uh, during the, the playoffs, Stanley Morgan in, in four playoff games – uh, Stanley Morgan was outstanding in terms of uh, making plays uh, as a gunner, not only as a return uh, on, on return teams, but as a gunner covering. And then during the regular season, uh, Stanley Morgan led the team with unassisted special teams tackles and total special teams tackles. He was the team leader in that regard. And when you have a, a guy out there as a gunner, it's going to get down the football field. The widest guy on the punt team getting down after the uh, punt return guy, he, you know, he's he's immediately down the football field. He, teams were doubling Stanley Morgan, and in some cases, even trying to triple the guy. He's an outstanding special teams player, so he's gonna he's he's a huge factor, obviously. Trent Taylor, as Dave mentioned, I mean, this guy was the 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 Bengals had problems with with guys holding onto the football. The first thing you have to do as a return guy is catch the damn football. And uh, the San Francisco game, you know, there were there were crucial fumbles that cost the Bengals the football game in overtime. You can't, I mean, your defense does a great job, three and out, punt team punts the ball away, and your punt return team puts it on the ground and gives it back to them 40 yards down the field, and they didn't do a damn thing to earn that 40 yards other than the mistake that you made. That's crippling to a defense. So as a punt returner, the first thing you have to do is be smart, catch the football, know when to fair catch it, when to uh, take some chances. All, all that is, is is big. Mike Thomas is another guy that has played really good special teams, and he's uh, getting reps. The thing with T. Higgins' shoulder, it's limiting his participation in practice. He's not taking reps, team reps. So all these guys are getting more reps. So the silver lining there is the Bengals coaching staff knows all about T. Higgins. They know what T. Higgins can do. But right now, they're trying to make an evaluation like we're talking about here on four, five, six, and even seven, if they keep seven. Um, or or who's going to be on the practice squad? Which guy is going to be a practice squad player? The, these are all these are all big questions. These are all things that need to be need to be answered. And um, I think one of the biggest battles is going to be Puka Williams 
and uh, um, Kwame Lasseter. They both can return punts. Who's going to do it better? Kwame Lasseter is is in the hunt. He's in the hunt. He's 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 not he's he's looking for a job now. He's looking for a roster spot. There is no question about it. Kendrick Pryor, another wide receiver, rookie out of Wisconsin. He's had some big catches. There, all these guys. What, what you what you want to do when you get to a professional camp? You're looking for opportunity. You get to an NFL camp. You want a chance to show what you can do. And if you get that chance, you want to execute. You don't want to blow it. You don't necessarily want it because of injury to a teammate. But if if you get a situation where T. Higgins is rehabbing and everybody else is going to get more reps, you have to maximize every single rep that you get. And I'm going to tip my cap to these guys because they're maximizing. And they're making it a tough decision. And that's what you want. I mean, as a coaching staff, as an organization, you want it to be a battle. You want it to be a competition. And all these guys are saying, I belong here. You brought me here for a reason. And, and they're, they're, all, they're all performing. And it's going to be a very interesting battle down the stretch. And the guy that's going to make the determination, the guy that's going to define the, the career path for these guys, be it a member of the 53 man, the practice squad, or out on the street and trying to find a job with another organization on their practice squad or their 53-man roster will be Darren Simmons. His input in terms of this guy can give me special team snaps on the punt team, the punt return team, the kickoff team, and the kickoff return team. I can get snaps out of this guy in four of my special teams units. I want this guy. That's going to decide the fate of some of these wide receivers that are going to be on the back end of the roster for sure. Arnold, hey Lap, will Zach try to go more up tempo, no huddle this year on offense? We, we've we've kind of talked about that. We think because of the offensive line, Joe Burrow will have more disposed to him as far as what he can do. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that um, in my mind, the perfect situation is being able to execute up tempo, slow tempo, no tempo. <laughs> I mean, I think you need to be able to do all of it. And I think it changes on a week-to-week -week basis. It all depends on what the opponent's strengths are, too. If the opponent uh, has a great offense and you go up tempo and you go three and out and that great offense is on the field stressing your defense again, you don't necessarily want to do that. I mean, it's not just necessarily what you think you can do. You, In a perfect world, you can do all of it. If, you've got, if you have a situation where I need to go up tempo on this particular drive and, and – you feel like you can go up tempo and you've executed it enough and you feel confident enough that everybody's going to do it. It's great. But like I said, if you're putting your defense on the football field and they're, they're having trouble stopping the opponent's offense and you go up tempo and you don't execute that defense. Now, now all of a sudden the time of possession is going to be 15 minute advantage to the opposition. You know, you're going to have the ball for, you know, <laughs> 15 minutes and they're going to have it for, or, you know, 40 minutes or whatever the heck it, it you don't want to be in that situation. You don't be, want to be dominated time of possession. So I think that on a on a week-by-week -week basis, if your best way to handle things is to go up-tempo offensively, do it. If it's not, if you – because when you're game planning, like offensive and defensive coordinators that game plan, they're game planning the whole big picture. They're not just game planning themselves against their opponent. That's the primary requirement, but you can't totally disregard, you know, what your what your how what you do impacts and trickle down effect and the ripple effect on your other phase of your uh, football team and special teams as well. I mean, you want to do everything you possibly can to help special teams dictate field position. And when special teams put you in a good positive uh, situation from a field position standpoint, take advantage of it. And tempo is a factor in that. So it's not just like, yeah, flip a coin. Let's, yeah, let's try, let's go up tempo. Or, and you don't necessarily want to go up tempo the entire football game. But if you feel like the entire, that's the best thing to do, do it, do it. Don't know how to go up tempo. If that, if you think that's the best thing, obviously the biggest thing that it, that it provides you is if you're not substituting, you're going up tempo and you get them on locked into a defensive, uh, uh, personnel grouping that's favorable to what you're doing, 
they have to call timeout to get out of it. They can't, if they substitute and you go up tempo and you catch them with 12 men on the field, that's what Sam Weiss was so brilliant with, with his up tempo. He basically dictated substitutions and, and uh, the frequency of substitutions and how teams were trying to substitute in the whole nine yards. So there's a ton of things to, to think about when you're thinking about temp and tempo is huge. Tempo is a big part of game plan, but I respect teams that don't just stay one tempo. You know, they just don't do one thing offensively with formation or whatever. And they don't do this just one thing with tempo. Tempo is another component, another, you know, seasoning that you put on your game plan uh, that, that that's going to be a thorn in the side of the defense. There's no question about it. M. Parker, Volson or Carmen, who wins lap? And we've had both of these guys on in the trenches. So make sure if you didn't see those interviews, you go back and catch those on the YouTube channel. Big battle right there. Another one. Um, I will give Jackson Carmen credit. Jackson Carmen, as a rookie, I think took things for granted and came in 20 pounds out of shape. And and and, and it started him in a, in a poor opening position. And it never went right. His, his rookie year never went as well as it could have because he did not start it off the right way. You can't come in as a rookie being 340 when they want you at 320 or 345 when they want you at 325, whatever the case may be. He came in right where they wanted him. The reporting weight was right on the money. Um, and he's had a very consistent training camp so far. The other thing about him, his rookie year is, boy, he'd show you he's got some talent now. This guy has some physical ability and skill set. And then one series would be, then it'd be like, what the heck? Looks like he never even played football before. And then he'd be somewhere in the middle. And you can't, you can't have the rises and the falls, the big re- ups and downs, no roller coaster ride. You have to be, there may be a blip. If you're playing against a great player, they may be a blip or performance, but you can't, you have to have consistency. Coaches have to know when they put you out in the football field, what they're going to get out of you and not guess. Well, oh, is, is, uh, this player going to be, is he going to perform for me well today? Or is it going to be one of those days? Or is it like, well, he played well in the first half. Will he play that well in the second half? Oh, he played a good first quarter. I don't know. What's he going to do in the second? You can't have that if you're a coach and it's, and for teammates, you know, you just, you need that consistency of performance. And I think he's Jackson Carmen is, is more of a pro this year. Jackson Carmen is trying to be a guy that's taking rookie players, including Volson under his wing. But I'll tell you what, the one thing that I really respect about Volson, guess who he's attached to the hip with? Ted Karras, who knows exactly what it's supposed to be look like. He's been in uh he's won been part of two championship Super Bowl winning teams. So Volson knows that Karras knows what he's talking about and Volson is me in my shadow. He is on his hip. Everywhere I see Ted Karras, I see Volson right there. I did the same thing with Bob Johnson. Bob Johnson was my mentor. And Bob Johnson knew every nuance of the playbook. He understood a lot. This guy was, you know, I tried to be a sponge with with respect to what Bob Johnson had to offer. And he was very, very generous in offering. So a rookie lineman, what you coaching is is vitally important. I had a great line coach in Bill Tiger Johnson. Volson has a great line coach in Frank Pollock. But the, the cherry on top of the Sunday is when a veteran established player says, I'm going to mentor you, son. And he takes you under his wing and he tells you all about the, the tricks of the trade, the ropes. You know, he shows you the rope. That is invaluable. That expedites your learning curve big time. And, uh, and you've got that going on. A guy who is doing that, even though he can't participate yet because of the tweak in his back, LC Collins is doing it with the tackles. Now he's like another coach. He's like Frank Pollock's assistant line coach during the one-on-one pass rush drills yesterday. He was coaching the tackles up now and, and Collins knows of what he speaks. He's, he's had great success. He's a great blocker. So right now it's, it's a battle. Now you've got Jackson Carmen has experience. He has NFL experience. Volson doesn't yet. The one thing that I will say about Volson and, and this is a rookie lineman adjustment always, in my mind, almost universally. 
when you hit in the National Football League, the person hitting you hits you with so much force, your feet stop. And at the level that Volson played, he probably never stopped his feet. He was overpowering these guys. He didn't play at the highest level of college football. And he's a stud. Volson's a stud. But you ram up against DJ Reader, he's going to stop you. You got to get your feet going again. You know, when your feet stop, you can't allow them to continue to stop. You got to get, you have to make that adjustment. Once contact's made, you got to, you got to drive your feet, pick your feet up, you know, ch foot, foot, uh, chop your feet, foot, foot fire. You, you got to get into that quicker. It's adjustment. I think he's going to, he's going to have to make a little bit. I'll tell you this though, standing in the end zone as they were warming up for the, uh, the back together practice on Saturday, 28,000, almost 300 people were in the stands. They're stretching and doing all their things toward the end of warm warmups. Jackson Carmen does a cartwheel. It looked like Nadia Coleman each looked like a, like a gymnast. It was a perfect cartwheel. 325 pound guy just snapped off a cartwheel at the end of warmups and put a big smile on his face. And I'm like, man, this guy has some athleticism. I mean, you don't see 300 pound plus guys doing cartwheels. <laughs> so athleticism is not his challenge. He has, he has the uh, the traits, the physical traits. There's no question about it. He's he's very gifted that way. Cliff, Dave, I thought Pat McAnally's show was the best show ever. Pat McAnally, he's something else, isn't he, Cliff? I mean, <laughs> I, I the, the year that I roomed with Pat McAnally at training camp was, well, actually, I'm not even sure if we were really true roommates, but we spent more time together than we did if we were roommates, I guess. He would he would be in there with his guitar. I mean, he'd have a guitar strumming away, you know, just uh, making a little music uh, on his own, which was really entertaining and really good. And the conversations were always at such a high level. And the guy the guy is a genius. There, there's no two ways about it. Um, and, and for somebody to have such a high level in, of intelligence compounded by uh, such a high level of athletic ability. He, he is, he's a rare breed. You know, here's a guy that had a basketball scholarship to UCLA from John Wooden in the Bruins heyday. I mean, that's how good a basketball player he was. He's playing against Karch Karai in uh, beach volleyball. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's, a uh, he's something else now. There's, there's no two ways about it. And just a tremendous sense of humor. Um, a high level sense of humor, as you could imagine. And he, and he had some great pranks that he pulled, including on head coach Forrest Gregg and Forrest Gregg rarely forget laughed. He rarely smiled, but Forrest Gregg would belly laugh <laughs> with Pat McAnally. And, uh, you know, everybody can understand why this, this, this guy is a unique dude, boy. I'm telling you, he's a talent, pure talent. Yeah, it was great. John Popovich went on Twitter and, and found that photo and uh posted it on twitter and that was fun to see it was <laughs> muñoz on one side of, of uh pat and you on the other side and, but uh yeah it was that was you know to, to get to hear people don't understand i get to sit here and listen to all this so then i get to go edit all the video and i get to dissect all these interviews yeah. and um pat would want i mean i think you and pat could probably talk for four or five oh, hours easily no no doubt no doubt he's uh he is and talk about a fertile mind. Um, I mean, starting lineup, starting lineup made has made Kenner Toys and, and Hasbro a good amount of money. But my man Pat McAnally now, <laughs> it is the gift that kept on giving. I mean, he is uh, a multi-millionaire from starting lineup alone. I got nothing but the utmost respect for Pat McAnally. I mean, what he did with his column um, was was phenomenal. It started, you know, just locally with the Enquirer and then his Harvard uh, connections, all these editors, uh, paper, uh, major publications around the country. He would visit with these guys and they'd pick up his column. And I mean, he's, he's syndicated by, you know, 200 newspapers. Everything Pat McAnally did that he, that he really wanted to, to uh, give his full focus to exploded. This dude is amazing, amazing. I think the thing people may not, Think about it. And you and I've talked about it. Your mom wasn't happy that you went to Syracuse. No, she she wouldn't talk to me for a year when I 
decided not to go to Harvard. And Pat McAnally, <laughs> he's like, all right, I just have to talk to you because I, I can't understand. I can't comprehend why you would not have gone to Harvard. How could you have not have gone to Harvard? And uh, we, we had some major debates about that for for a long time during various training camps. And uh, yeah, he just he couldn't he couldn't figure that one out. And then my son did the same thing and I couldn't say anything about it. He, he got accepted to Harvard and he didn't go either. But my nephew, uh, he finally he got accepted. He went and he he was a co-captain with Ryan Fitzpatrick at Harvard. And that's, you know, it, worked, it turned out great for him. So yeah, everybody has to make choices, you know. Another former guest on In the Trenches was our guy, LC. You still have to get together with him for dinner. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, Ryan wants to know when the apps becomes worrisome as we get closer and closer to the season. Yeah, I mean, LC's a a pro's pro. Um, He'll be ready. He'll be ready for the Pittsburgh Steelers game, the opener at Paul Brown Stadium. I wouldn't play him at all in the preseason. Wouldn't do it. There's a bunch of guys I wouldn't play. And like I said before, I think uh, if he is back for the Rams practice, the two practices that they're working against each other before they play in that final preseason game that's nationally televised that no starters are going to play in. <laughs> but what what they should do, the network should televise the group practice uh, because you know now you're going to have – this is where the rubber is going to meet the road – if they haven't made a decision on the left guard position, Jackson Carmen and Cordell Volson working against number 99, Aaron Donald, in pass rush drill, that might be a little determining factor. Which guy, which guy can pass block Aaron Donald the best? Because whoever can at least compete against a guy like him, you're not going to find any better. Nobody will be any better during the course of the regular season than going against Aaron Donald because those pass rush, those are live. That's that's live action. Um, there's no quarterback or anything they're get they're hitting. You know, they're gonna have they'll either have of some kind of marker, you know, seven yards from the center, nine yards from the center, depending on the depth of the drop, and you have to protect that that area. Um, but that that's full go. And and then when you're running stunts and and you're working against, you know, that Rams defensive line. And they're running tackle, tackle twists and tackle end stunts and ET stunts and all those kind of things. Then your offensive line is really tested. And if LC goes through that, there's going to be one practice that's going to be like that. The second day will be more walk through because you're getting closer and closer to the game. But boy, that that workout, that day's work against the Rams toward the end of training camp is going to be the biggest day of training camp, I think, to make strides and to get yourself the most ready to play in a regular season game. So, honestly, I think if LC gets a little bit of work the week before the Rams uh, come to town and then gets work that entire week against the Rams, he'll be good to go. He'll he'll definitely be good to go. All right. Dustin asks, basically, it's the Jesse Bates question. Dave, let's say Jesse has just a solid year. Not spectacular, not bad, just solid. What happens to his price value then? Does it stay the same as what he would be going for monetarily now? Well, that's a great question. I mean, you know, where, where's your where's your market value at that point in time? Um, you know, the, the the Bengals are just one of 32 teams that are making an evaluation on Jesse Bates. You know, the thing is, uh, teams might look at it a little bit differently. What's the body of work? I'm not just going to look at this particular season. I'm going to look at the body of work. Other teams may say, you know, I'm pretty good at the safety position, but Jesse Bates, yeah, let me see. And really put a big evaluation on this particular year. So I think teams are going to have different answers to that. I think, you know, a lot of teams might say, you know, what have you shown me lately? Uh, if if teams put on uh, his playoff run, you know, he's he might have been the best defensive player in the playoffs, it's postseason stats. You know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, they had eight interceptions, seven different people. The only one, the only player that had multiple interceptions, Jesse Bates, had two interceptions, and both of them were massive, massive plays determining the outcome of uh, football games. Jesse Bates also had 11 uh, unassisted tackles and 20 tackles in the four football games. You know, that's that's pretty darn good. That's pretty 
pretty efficient. That's that's getting involved. Um, he defended six passes on top of the interceptions. He knocked down, got his hand on six passes. That uh, more than doubled the next guy on the football team. So Jesse Bates was around the football, making plays on the football, doing a lot of things. Uh, when, when it counted the most, he played his best football in the postseason, in the postseason run. Teams might look at that. There's all different kinds of ways uh, teams might look at an evaluation process on Jesse Bates. All I know is I want, I'd want him on my team because, I mean, he's, he's a very, very special human being as well. And you got to take that into account. And, and only the Bengals would know really the kind of person that he is because they've been around him the longest. It's only the only place he's been. But word spreads about people that are outstanding and people that are jerks. <laughs> it gets around the league very, very quickly. And Jesse Bates, it's already circulated around the league what a special guy Jesse Bates is, believe me. So that's going to be a very interesting negotiation to see how that uh, finalizes. And I think Jesse will be in the – it'll almost be in the same situation as we were talking about LC. Jesse Bates comes back, you know, just before the Rams game and participates in that Rams – uh, those workouts against the Rams, that that's going to be even more important work than the game is because a lot of these guys aren't going to play in the game. I think that'll be a, a big opportunity for Jesse to uh, knock off some rust and dust before he were to line up against the, the Pittsburgh Steelers in that opener as well, if, if in fact it works out that way. Dave, I love and respect Big Willie. When he spoke about Joe Walter mentoring him, Made me proud. Boyd said the same about AJ Green. Yep, and I mean that's that's the thing that I was talking about a little earlier. Um, it's the way of the world in the in the National Football League and professional athletics is what you know in general. Guys that mentor teammates are great teammates. You know, you, you can't have the attitude. For example, all right, Jackson Carmen, if he's mentoring Volson like he's trying to help him, basically they're competing for the same job. It's a very, very unique dynamic. I mean, I remember doing it to rookies, rookie linemen over the years, and I knew damn well that they were drafted to try to take my job and to take other guys' jobs in the offensive line. But if you're a good teammate, the first thing you want to do is get to make the team better. And the best way to make the team better is to make sure that every player knows what's going on, all your teammates. And if you feel like you can help in that regard, it's your obligation to do it. If you're a good teammate, now if you're a selfish teammate, and there are there have been cases, there are guys that pff, I'm not going to give you the time of day, man. You're trying to take my job. Hell with you, man. I'm gonna I'll sabotage you. I, I'm gonna make sure you don't take my job. Those are the kind of guys. When your best players are that kind of guy, you don't win. When your best players are the kind of guys that will mentor and take guys under their wing, and they're they're good guys. You, you're going to win football games. It's almost it's almost universal. If your best players have too much jerk factor, you're going to struggle. If your best players are gems on and off the football field, you're going to win a lot of football games, period. And, and you can probably say it about any business. I bet if we had any, you know, vice president, president, uh, CEO of any major company, they'd probably say the same thing. You know, if, if, if guys that they have in, in key leadership positions – if a couple of them are jerks, they're in trouble. <laughs> it's, it's it's just human nature, and uh, yeah, it's that big 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 Willie benefited from Joe Walter, and then what happens then? Big Willie pays it forward. I learned from Joe. Joe is my mentor. I'm going to do the same thing with the next generation of tackles that come in here. I'm going to make sure that I the knowledge that Joe gave to me, I'm passing it along, man. I'm I'm paying it forward. All right, this is getting back to the tight end, Hayden Hurst. Mr. Whisper, Dave, Hayden Hurst is getting a lot of praise as an upgraded tight end. What is it specifically that he is doing better over C.J. Uzama? Yeah, well, I think that uh, and it's, the proof's going to be in the pudding because C.J. Uzama made massive contributions last year. C.J. Uzama and Joe Burrow had a connection. And Joe Burrow, he'll make connections. You know, I thought he made a great connection with Kwame Lasseter in, uh, in, in a very short period of time. 
because Joe Burrow studies body mechanics. Joe Burrow studies how guys run, how they run routes, and he starts to connect with that and adjust to it. And and uh, and he got a connection early on. I thought with Lassiter, he got a connection with CJ, and it, connection with Hurst is going to be there because, like I said, I think that the uh, the thing that that Hayden Hurst is doing so well, just about everybody's eye is his route running. He's like a big wide out. You know, he runs routes like a 205 pound wide receiver and he's close to the 250. The guy's 6'5 plus and 250 pounds and he's extremely smooth in his route running ability. And and he will catch the football and be able to run after catch. He's got his size speed ratio is is outstanding. He's got really good speed. The kid he was a first round draft pick. He was the 27th pick of the draft coming out of South Carolina. So obviously he's got um, physical traits that uh, that you like to see. Now, all of this looks good in practice. See how it translates to games. That's the big deal. And the other thing that CJ Izama did is he put his hand on the ground at the end of the line of scrimmage and blocked people. And Hayden Hurst is showing that, I mean, he's, he's not shying away uh, from, you know, battles with Hendri- Trey Hendrickson and, other defensive ends or outside linebackers. So that that's going to be the key is um, will he be able to put his hand in the ground at the end of the line of scrimmage and, and run the football if what the defense poses is better, best for the offense to run it? Okay, bring him in. If you've, already, you've got him in a, in a flex position out there, bring him back into the end of the line of scrimmage, put his hand in the ground and block that guy. That's going to be the, the proof will be in the pudding, as they say. Talking about Matthew here. Matthew, how Dax Hill doing? Haven't heard anything. Doing fine. Dax Hill's doing doing fine. Now, is he perfect every play? No. Is it anybody perfect every play? Any every play? No. I mean, is he is he made a rookie mistake or two? Yeah. But one thing that Dax Hill and other uh, defensive backs they drafted have shown, wow, oh, can run, man. This defense is put together very very well. They're stout and strong in the interior of their defensive line. Um, they're they're very very athletic on the edge. They can they can cause havoc on the edge with that edge rush, and they've got multiple people that can do that. Their linebackers are athletic. They can really uh, they they've got range. They can run and the speed in the secondary. We talked about it when they all got drafted. Uh, four three eight two four three eights and a four three six. They got another free agent uh, defensive back that runs four three six, and it a lot of times it's like, all right, well that's straight line track speed, that's a forty yard dash. Very rarely in a football game you run forty yards straight, you know, and you don't have to you don't have to deviate, you don't have to do anything from a football standpoint, change direction. Block. Sometimes that forty yard dash does not translate to functional football speed. Well, this is translated to functional football speed. Uh, Brandon Allen. Talked about it. He said, "Man, I was I was going to make a throw to a to a receiver that was pretty open, and all of a sudden, Dax Hill turned on the Jets from the opposite side of the field and and closed ground so quickly. He said I was just going to lollipop that bad boy out there. He said I had to change the way I threw the football and the trajectory and the uh, the placement of the football all because of Dax Hill running, react, reacting and running. And it wasn't that Dax Hill blew a coverage. Dax Hill realized somebody had blown a coverage and he was coming to help. So these guys that are running 438, 436, recoverability speed is a, it's a golden trait to have in the National Football League because the other guys are good. They get paid too. And sometimes guys are wide open, whether it be a mistake or just a, you know, somebody just beat somebody physically so bad with a double move or whatever. You're going to have to have recoverability speed. And this defense is fast. They had a low red zone drill on, on the Saturday workout. Um, and, and the defense did not allow the offense to score on a play at any point during that, uh, during that low red zone. It was like 15 snaps probably. And boy, did they show some team speed now. They can, they can really run, even in a compressed field. Sometimes team speed shows up even more in a compressed field, but uh, you know if, if you're if if you're covering a, a 50 or 60 yard field, you notice that speed because you know, more yards are being covered. 
man, these guys, they're not only fast, they're quick. They make quick reactions. It, it, it is translated to functional football speed. And, and I think this is probably one of the fastest teams that Lou, Lou Anarumo has probably ever been part of. Move back to the offense, offensive line. How does Ted Karras look? Ted Karras is, uh, is every day is a good day for football for Ted Karras. He loves the game. He loves everything about it, and it's contagious. Um, he's not only the leader of the offensive line, but he, he understands, though, too. Jonah Williams, Jonah Williams had a very strong camp, in my opinion, so far. And Ted Karras said, Jonah, you've been here longer than any other offensive lineman, which is saying something because Jonah Williams hadn't been here that long. But every other starter in that offensive line, every other lineman, in fact, Jonah's kind of like been here in Cincinnati the longest. So Ted Karras says, out of respect, you, you, you've been here from in the good, the good times and the bad, and you're a reason that the good turned, uh, the bad turned into the good. You're a big part of that. I'm going to follow your lead. So Ted Karras gets it. Ted Karras understands he doesn't want to step on Jonah Williams. And Jonah's not necessarily a, a real uh, vocal leader. He leads by example, but he's becoming more and more vocal. And I think part of that is, is Ted Karras's influence a little bit. So um, I think he's he's been good for the football team on the field, in the locker room, in the community. Every way you, you can be good, I think Ted Karras has been good. And, and uh, like I said before, playing with Tom Brady – and, and the Patriots and winning two Super Bowls, he knows, and, and, and playing for Dante Scarnecchia as an offensive line coach, he knows exactly what things are supposed to look like and, uh, and, and how things are supposed to be done. And to me, it, it's very interesting. I'll watch uh, Frank Pollock do installation. And what was taking rookies like a week to comprehend, taking the veteran players a day, like, you know, just a day, because they've seen it all. It's not like it's the first time they've ever been explained from an installation standpoint to these veteran players. They may call it something different. Like, they, you know, uh, Frank may be uh, uh, speaking Spanish, and they've learned German. Now they're going to have to learn it in Spanish. They already know the calls and all the identifications and communications in a different language. They just have to unlearn and relearn. But in terms of understanding, uh, you know, design, schematic, configuration, they got it in a day. It's like, I've, I've been there, done this, seen it. It's, it's a major, major difference. There's no question. Mr. Whisperback, Joseph Asai looking compared to last year. Yeah, he's not, he's not physically there yet, but he's getting there. He's, he's starting to take some team reps. Um, Osai, he was, he was rated by pro football focus as, one of the best uh, rookies uh, in training camp. I mean, he got hurt in the first game. He, he sacked the goat in his second snap in the, in the preseason game at Tampa Bay. And uh, then he injured a knee and injured his wrist. But Joseph Osai has some rare ability as an edge rush guy. Osai and Hubert, they drafted, these are two guys they drafted not in this past draft, but the year before, but they're both virtually rookies as well. I mean, Hubert got hurt. Uh, in the off season, tore a pectoral muscle doing bench press. So he never even got on the football field. Osai got hurt very early in the first preseason game. So literally Osai got hurt like it would be 10 days from now is when Osai's injury happened. Um, and that unfortunate because, I mean, he, he was showing that he could get some things done. But these are guys like it's, oh, do you go out and get another pass rusher? Well, if everybody has to do a little, nobody has to do a lot. I mean, if Osai can show that he can, uh, you know, he can get some things done. Khalid Kareem, if he gets healthy, get his shoulder right, he can get some things done. Hubert, whoever it is, you just have to, if you can get contributions from a few guys in a rotation, you don't have to try to go out and get, you know, expend a bunch of draft picks in a trade to try to get a guy. I think they've got some guys that they can develop a little bit. And Osai is definitely one of those guys. I mean, when you see him on a football field or walking around in a locker room in shorts and a T-shirt, oh, this dude's impressive now. I mean, you know, it's like, if we, what's my line? What's this guy do for our living? Would not surprise you when he signed in as a pro football player because this dude, 
He looks the part, man. Gina comes in with, uh, does Mike Zimmer still live in the area? Maybe the Bengals can bring him in as a consultant. We love Zim. Well, Zim's son, Adam, is on the staff as a defensive assistant and a consultant as such. Um, Adam Zimmer was coaching with his dad uh, up in Minnesota until, you know, things things ended up there. But uh, so the Bengals uh, know Adam Zimmer, Zimmer well. He, he had worked with the Bengals with his dad before they went up to Minnesota. Um, Mike has a, uh, a big farm down in uh, Kentucky, a bunch of acres. Uh, he's building a pond, a lake, where I guess be bigger than a pond, it'd be a lake, man-made lake that he's putting on it. He's going to stock it with all kinds of fish. Zim is a big hunter fisherman. So right now he is uh, he's spending some time in the area. He's, uh, I'm not sure, I'm trying to remember if he's got, he's got another year that the Minnesota Vikings have to pay him. So he's, he's making good money hunting and fishing right now because head coaches' contracts are guaranteed. They get their money no matter what. And uh, he's earned it. He earned it for sure. And that's probably the last question, Dave, is we've uh, coming up on a, an hour. That's how quick it goes. Dan, the man, one of our regulars. Good to mm -hmm. see you back, Dan. Lap, what are your expectations of a backup QB? And is Allen that guy, or are Browning and Plight a threat to take the slot? Yeah, I think I think Brandon Allen is that guy. Um, but you know, he still has to compete. Browning, Plitt, they they all they all show that they belong, and that you know their opportunity um, is is earned. And right now, like we talked about uh, with injuries to the receiver position, T Higgins, not able to take all the reps because rehabilitating from that shoulder. Um, you know, that, honestly, you got quarterbacks because of the appendectomy that Joe Burrow is recovering from. They're getting a lot of reps. They're getting reps that they would not otherwise have gotten. Uh, you've got Allen, Brandon Allen's taking reps of the starter. Browning is taking Allen's reps that would have been a backup and played as well as a, as a third quarterback. So, you know, I think Brandon Allen is that guy. Brandon Allen put up some big numbers against the Houston Texans when he was a starting quarterback in in uh, the system that that Zach Taylor was implementing. And and he and Zach Taylor were together back in the Rams days when they were both, you know, with the Rams. So I think again, we talk about trust as a as a big factor with respect to quarterback. You know, trust quarterback has to have in his receivers and tight ends and all that. Well, the coach. And the quarterback, there has to be a trust, a level of respect and trust both ways. And and there is that with Brandon Allen and with Zach Taylor. So, yeah, I, and, I, and I do think that Joe Burrow uh, has trust in Brandon Allen. When he comes off the football field, Brandon Allen gives him great information, great feedback. You know, Joe Burrow tells Brandon Allen what he saw on the field. Brandon Allen tells Joe Burrow what he saw from the sideline. And, you know, if it matches, great. If there, if there doesn't match, maybe talk through it a little bit or whatever the case may be. It's, it's like having another set of eyes out there um, that, that, that a starting quarterback has great value in being able to come off the football field and dialogue like that with, with the backup quarterback. So I think that uh, the backup quarterback position is Brandon Allen's. It's his to lose, and I don't think he's about to – to lose it any anytime soon. I think he's uh he understands the offense. He's executing it at a at a good level. So see how he, he performs at uh you know in the preseason games and see how the others do as well. But uh, I don't think we're gonna see Joe Burrow in the preseason. Maybe in the last preseason game take a snap from center, hand it off to the running back and do a parade wave as he leaves the football field. That'd be about it. I don't think you're gonna expose uh Joe Burrow, because, you know, the thing we're talking about with, with Joe healing, but how about the torque you have to do it, it throwing the quarterback, throwing the football as a quarterback in the NFL and the torque you're putting right in the in the core of your body, right where you had the, the procedure done, take the appendix out. And then if you get hit, it has to be totally healed if you get hit right there. I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of reasons uh, for Joe Burrow to just get sharp at training camp 
against his teammates when he comes back and don't expose him to anything unnecessarily. I, I want to add to that day. I want to ask you this question. How important is the backup quarterback? Is it, usually you never see the quarterback as, a, as the starter unless he goes down. Yep. But I, I, you think of Tom Brady for many years, Brian Hoyer, who I covered in high school out of the Cleveland area was Tom Brady's backup. And there's a reason he was always winning that job every year because it has to be that communication. There is, again, it's, it's trust. And uh, you know, that has to be on, on both levels. And um, in, in my opinion, the, the backup quarterback is almost <laughs> like a, an assistant to the quarterback coach. I mean, he's, he's another coach really. And, and, and the backup quarterback also calms the starter down when he comes to the sideline after something unfortunate may occur. Um, they, they, that's a big role. Brandon Allen understands everything there is to understand about playing quarterback in the national football league. And uh, yeah, that, that, that role is, is significant And the quarterback room is, is a big deal. Quarterback room, the starting quarterback has to feel comfortable about who's with him in the quarterback room. And I know that Joe Burrow and Brandon Allen have a bond, not just as quarterbacks, but as, you know, friends and people. And they, they are very, very comfortable with each other. And they, they hold two hugely important uh, roles in that quarterback room, which is the most important room, you know, in the, in the position group for sure. I lied. We're going to add one more. We're going to let Richard Hampton squeeze in here because he, 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 I think he kind of missed when you talked about T. Higgins earlier. What's the news on T. Higgins? Uh, vital part, what happened last season. Took a little heat towards the end of the season, but as we learned, played injured and coming off that injury, uh, surgery. What, what do you feel is the latest on him as far as when he'll be available to go 100%? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, he's ramping up. I have a lot of respect for T Higgins because T Higgins, everybody in the national football league at some point in time during the season, you have to play hurt. You have to know the difference between being hurt and being injured and everybody has to play hurt. Few players decide that they're going to make the sacrifice for the better of their team to play injured. And he was, he played injured. He had a shoulder injury to the point where even with the harness, it would sublux and come out of place and they'd have to put it back in place during the course of the game. And he still continued to play every snap he could down the stretch and made big plays all through the playoffs, including the touchdown catch that he had in the Super Bowl. It was a, uh, you know, a big time play. And it, to me, that is a big hearted competitor. You know, I mean, um, he didn't have to play. I mean, the teammates, everybody would have understood with that type of an injury. And they, they kept the injury. They would just put it on the injury report. It's a shoulder injury. That could be anything. You know, it could be something real minor and something significant, which it turned out to be very significant with respect to T. Higgins. He had surgery on it. Had to have surgery to tighten the socket up and all that. And now he's, uh, you know, rehabbing from that. And they're being smart in terms of not exposing him to uh, an extraordinary number of uh, team snaps right now. So he's going to be fine. And T Higgins will compete. And I got a big time amount of respect uh, for T Higgins, as I'm sure every one of his teammates does what he sacrificed last year. And, the, and he's a tough dude with a high pain tolerance to play through what he played through last year. All right, everybody, that wraps it up. We want to thank everybody for being with us today on In the Trenches with Dave Lapham from the First Star Logistics Studios. As always, we appreciate everything First Star does for us here in our studio when we come in each week and, and do the work. We want to also remind you, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to the channel. Also, hit the like button. That helps us get this out to more people and to find that Dave's out here doing this because we've been doing a little over a year, over a million views in just over a year and growing. We want to thank that. That's because of you, not, not anything. We, we just provide the content. You're the ones that have to watch it, have to like it. Also a reminder, we just added something new to the channel with some YouTube shorts and we'll be doing more of those as we go. So until next time for Dave. And, and just to add one thing, Dave, you know, we talked about uh, players asking intelligent questions. Anybody can ask questions. You guys, 
you always bring it. You guys ask great questions, and I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you, everybody. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Brakes? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You yeah. know, you know, got to get that body right. That's yeah. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out FirstStarLogistics.com.